All right, welcome everybody. John Perry here. I am with Stefan um, Hurtubis. <laughs> yeah. Saying that right, right? Yeah. Okay. Hello. <laughs> uh i am very excited about today we're going to talk about linguistics which is a fairly new field in science it is an actual science a lot of people think language literature you know um but linguistics is a science it is the study of this natural phenomena that we call language and very fascinating a fairly new field Mm -hmm. And we've got an expert here to talk with us about it. <laughs> Hope so, yeah. <laughs> uh, to start off, let's give people this Russian sentence. Okay. And, right. sure. and, and let them think about it for a bit. Here. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So uh, any setup or just give them the sentence and let them mull over it? Yeah, yeah just give them the sentence. All right, all right. So uh, uh, more people have been to Russia than I have. Does that sentence make sense? More people have been to Russia than I have. Uh, think about what you think that means. Maybe even write it in the comments what you think that means, because we're going to talk about this later. It's a really um, interesting sentence. And I guess also to start off, let's, let's talk about, real quick about our sure. t-shirts. Yeah, yeah. I'm sporting NASA because, as you know, the uh, Insight probe has successfully landed, and I'm kind of celebrating that today, a little bit late. And you are wearing... Yeah, this is actually a linguistics t-shirt uh, associated with uh, the YouTube channel that I, I write for called The Ling Space. Uh, the Ling Space. Yes, yes. Uh, we could always talk about that a little bit more, but uh, mm. basically this is a, a Christmas t-shirt. Uh, it's a uh, sort of syntactic representation of the structure of the phrase Oh Christmas Tree from the song Oh Christmas Tree. Uh, wrapped around an actual Christmas tree. Uh, I don't know how much I want to get into the details, but uh, if anyone's uh, interested, it's available at our store. <laughs> Sweet. Awesome. Oh, well, I'll have to put up a link for them. Sure, yeah. Um, afterwards, also put up a link to your Absolutely. The, 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 uh, the YouTube channel. So, right, yeah. Well, let's dig into, I guess, the history of this science that we call linguistics. Sure, yeah. Um, and, and why is it a science versus... Yeah, we can get into that uh, yeah. too for sure. Um, so yeah, you know, as as you mentioned, John, I mean, it's it's in one way, it's a very young field. Um, I mean, modern linguistics, you know, arguably dates back to um, the 1950s, the 1960s. Um, you could sort of get away with dialing it back to maybe the end of the 19th century, beginning of the 20th century, depending on how you know how far you want to go back in terms of. Um, uh, Precursors to Noam Chomsky, which is sort of uh, the father of modern linguistics, um, but you know maybe focusing on on Chomsky a bit since he's been so influential in the field. Mm -hmm. um, you know he uh, started this project of approaching language from um, not only a scientific perspective but uh, more narrowly a psychological perspective. So mm -hmm. you know he's. He played a big role in beginning to view language not just as this kind of, I don't know, object that floats out there in the world, but something that is realized in people's brains, something that is a fundamentally human activity, um, and something that we can actually ask questions about and get answers to as long as we ask those questions in the right way um, and approach getting at those answers in the right yeah. way. In this case, I mean scientifically. Right. So it, language is a natural phenomenon, just like a storm, just like a mountain. Sure. Yeah. And it can be studied very analytically. Yeah, absolutely. Very precisely. Yeah. Um, something that you had mentioned to me when we we went and had drinks the other night to talk about this ahead of time, uh, that you, when you were studying linguistics, you studied French speakers. Right. And that it's common for linguists to study a f study communication in a language that they're not very familiar with because it helps sure. you step away from your own, like, we use language all the time, so it's hard to study it. Right. If you're studying, if you, if you speak English and you're studying an English speaker, it's hard to realize what's actually happening there. Yeah, so, um, you know, it, it, for sure you can, you can do ling good linguistic research on your own mother tongue, your native yeah. language. Um, it's possible. But yeah, there is kind of this interesting barrier. I, I think people have a hard time getting over the idea that we really can study um, language scientifically and, and, and we really can 
get at at these questions. Um, I think people kind of feel a little bit like, oh, well, because it's it's fundamentally human, it's so tied into who we are, or we can never really step back enough to um, really get, uh, you know, get a good grip on it. Um, but yeah, I mean, a lot of the time, um, linguists will uh, rely on the judgments and behavior of speakers of a language other than their own. Usually when they, you do enough research, you become familiar with the language anyway over time. Yeah. Um, but you still end up relying ultimately on um, the speakers of the language that's of interest to you. Uh, obviously with you know the tools you've developed so that you know what kinds of questions to ask and what sorts of, um, what sorts of data you want to elicit from a speaker of that language. Yeah. Um, and, and certainly that helps with the process. Uh, yeah, for sure. Of, of just kind of objectifying it and, and, um, you know, putting it under the metaphorical microscope. Yeah. You know what, one of the interesting things that I, I, I was thinking about just thinking about the study of language is it, it almost seems like, uh, oh, all of us know how language works cause we use it every day, but we actually don't. I mean, we, we understand how language works almost as much as we understand how we make our heartbeat. You know, it's something that really does have to be studied. Yeah. Objectively. Yeah. It, it, this is something else that it can be tricky to get across. Uh, you know, people have a very, very strong sense um, that they know how their language works or that they know how language works in general. Um, a stronger sense, I think, than people have with the heart or you know, some other internal organ or system. Um, I think people don't confuse themselves with a cardiologist just because they have a heart. Yeah. Um, but oddly enough, I think people can get a little bit confused and think of themselves as a linguist, yeah. uh, even if they haven't really spent any time <laughs> studying or <laughs> yeah. thinking about language. Um, yeah. And that's fair. I mean, you know, language is central to culture. It's central to uh, human civilization as a whole. Uh, we, I, I think arguably it wouldn't yeah. exist without it. it it's fundamental to accumulating and passing down knowledge, especially in the form of writing. Uh, so it's kind of hard to get over in that sense, right? It's yeah. kind of hard to see past it as like, oh, wait, there's there's this thing that I could now focus on and look at and ask questions about. Um, yeah. Yeah, it, really a strange phenomena. And the, the thumbnail of this video was Coco the Gorilla. Right. Who was very famous for being able to speak sign language. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think, I mean, that's a little bit of a, <laughs> it's a little bit of blown out of proportion, uh, the way that people think that this gorilla can actually speak. I guess Coco passed away. Recently, uh, yeah. yeah, within the last few months, I think. But I think that before we can really even understand why what Coco was doing isn't true language in the sense that you and I are speaking language right yeah. now, I think before that, it's probably going to be good to talk about what a natural language is, sure. What a pigeon is, okay. and what a creole is, because this is this is a really interesting phenomena, the pigeon creole phenomena. Right. Yeah. So I, yeah, it could be a good segue. Yeah. Yeah. For how, sure. how would you describe a natural language? Yeah. Um, so I mean, in one sense, natural language is kind of just synonymous with human language. Uh, not not human communication broadly, because there are all kinds of ways we communicate with each other that aren't necessarily linguistic in nature. Yeah. I mean, even the clothes we're wearing right now is a kind of signaling, a kind of communication. Right. Um, but I, another way of thinking of natural language is in opposition to artificial or constructed languages. Mm -hmm. um, that's a broad term as well. Uh, an artificial language could be a computer programming language. Uh, yeah. It could be the language of logic, which is a system of symbols and rules about how to put them together. Uh, it could be any number of um, engineered languages that have been designed with a particular goal in mind. You know, let's say to modify or fix language in some way. Uh, well, we had like Esperanto is probably yeah, yeah. Then the you most have, famous construction. Sure, language. yeah. Then you hang on. Yeah, well, uh, yeah. Those are yeah. two great examples. I mean, in the case of Esperanto, you've got. Uh, what you might call an auxiliary language, a language which has been developed to supplement people's other languages. Yeah. Um, and, and it had a particular goal in mind, right? It has a particular goal in mind. I mean, I, I, I'm not an Esperanto speaker, so a, an es Esperantist might be yeah. better suited to sort of get into these questions in depth. But basically, um, the idea behind Esperanto was to create a, a, a language in which everyone could speak with one another and which didn't privilege anyone else's 
previous existing linguistic knowledge. So right. arguably today, English is very much the lingua franca of the world. It's, right. it's, or certainly it's up there in terms of the language that a lot of business is done in. Um, and that's just because we won wars and yeah, a lot of it's just con and, contingent on yeah. culture and history, et cetera. Right. Um, and Esperanto, I mean, in part, is it's kind of this attempt to say, well, we don't want to give an unfair advantage to people who grew up speaking English in a situation where English ends up being the language of commerce. Right. Um, and so it was sort of built from the ground up in a way from a cobbled together from a lot of different European languages. Um, Esperanto was, yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, Klingon, not so much. Yeah, um, yeah. But but that's another example of a constructed language with a particular goal in mind, although in this case, an artistic goal, right? So, yeah. I mean, especially these days, you know, Hollywood and uh, and and the like, they, they, they get so into constructing these uh, worlds of fantasy and science fiction that they actually end up hiring linguists like me mm -hmm. uh, to design languages for their culture, you know, whether it's Dothraki and Game mm -hmm. of Thrones, you know, David J. Peterson designed that one, yeah. but based off of the original work of George R. R. Martin. Um, yeah. Klingon was an, another example, of course, of, yeah, a language which was designed by a linguist um, with the purpose of, again, sounding good on the screen. Mm -hmm. I mean, sometimes the goal can be to mimic a particular existing language that you just like the sound of and, right. you know, want to go in that direction. Or sometimes it can be, uh, uh, you know, I want to design a writing system that looks really pretty. <laughs> yeah. Uh, we got a question that's really relevant to this, natural sure. languages. Are there certain sounds that are common among the different languages? Uh, yeah, you can talk about sounds being more or less common. Um, for instance, a, a language can have more or 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 less vowel sounds. So, I mean, English has probably somewhere between ten and fifteen. Um, it's kind of tricky to count. It, it depends yeah. on what parameters you want to use. Maybe which accent you're using too. Right? That too. Yeah. Which 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 dialect? Um, uh, other languages have as few as as three. Uh, but as you move from the languages with more vowels to the languages with fewer vowels, there there is, it's not random. So there tends to be a sort of a core trio of vowels. Um, I think it's something like uh, E, A, uh, and U, um, mm. which are sort of maximally distinct from each other. And then as you move from that trio of vowels to languages which add more distinctions, yeah. uh, you, you usually don't take those away, you add to them. Right. Um, in the in sort of the domain of consonants, um, yeah, you get sounds that are are especially common, uh, and then you get sounds that are especially uncommon, like the interdental fricative, which is uh, <laughs> putting your tongue between your teeth and going th or th. Yeah. Uh, we have it in English, but it's actually a relatively uncommon sound amongst mm. the world's languages, and tends to give people, um, including Quebec French speakers, a lot of trouble with it. Yeah, um, it ends up being usually turned into either a D or a T sound, right. uh, as opposed to this continuous flow of air through the mouth. Yeah, um, and and an American would see that as a speech impediment that, <laughs> you know, because a lot of Americans do the, the T or D sound too. Sure, yeah. But it's yeah. considered a speech impediment. Um, when it, yeah, but in, in fact, it's yeah. just, there's something about it that's especially challenging and which, yeah. and which in turn makes it kind of rare. Uh, the, so I've, I've noticed, I'm, I'm in Montreal now, and the language here is French, and I'm having major difficulties distinguishing vowels in French mm. because my ears are not tuned to it. Right. But you were telling me that as babies, the babble that babies do right. really incorporates pretty much every weird sound that every language has in it. Yeah, yeah. So um, I, can, I can talk a little bit about language acquisition here. Um, you know, the, there does tend to be this sort of un universal order in which children acquire the sounds of their language. Um, obviously the end states end up being very different, uh, yeah. but the beginning stages end up being remarkably similar. Um, mm -hmm. And as you mentioned, the babbling sounds of, of young infants tend to be um, very similar to each other, regardless of the linguistic environment in which they're mm -hmm. being raised. Um, and they tend to be somewhat representative of the world's language as a whole. As a whole. Uh, but then that sort of gets whittled down. Uh, right. wh whittled down not just in terms of, of the sounds they produce, but it, from the, in terms of the sounds that they can actually categorically perceive. Um, oh, really? it, it might be interesting here just to mention that in terms of the actual acoustic signal between different vowel sounds or different consonant sounds, it really is continuous. So, you know, the, the difference between E and U and A it's not physically categorical. 
uh, right? You can go from E U A, right? Yeah. Um, and it's like, with, like a with rainbow, an infinite variation in between. Yeah. What's interesting about the way the human brain works with respect to these sounds is that we we cut them up. Yeah. So we don't, you know, if you were to graph a person's perception, you don't get this line of like, as you move from one vowel to another, uh, it sounds more like one and then more like the other. Actually, you get this really strong contrast where yeah. the human perception quickly flips from perceiving one, one sound to another. Uh, and eventually we, we lose a lot of these distinctions. We just can't really hear anymore the difference between, uh, you know, uh, A and E. You right. know, and these you know minor variations that maybe aren't contrastive in your own right. language. Right, but but are very distinct in another language. So yeah, yeah. So yeah. To another person's ears, of course, they'll be like, of course, those are different sounds. Yeah. I mean, uh, maybe an example of this uh, would be, uh, you know, so we we have we have a certain degree of variation in English where stop consonants like uh, P and T and K, uh, when they're at the end of a syllable. Um, they're basically just in their standard form, P or T or K, but when they're at the beginning of a syllable, they're kind of followed up with this little puff of air. Um, and you can actually put a, like a little piece of paper in front of your mouth. Actually, if you don't mind, maybe I would yeah. just sort of yeah. demonstrate that here. So, you know, if I say um, something like uh, stop, you, you don't really see the paper moving at all. Mm -hmm. But if I say pot, you actually oh, see a little bit yeah. of a movement there. Now, that's not something we hear, um, it's something that happens in English, but it's not something that's contrastive. It doesn't act, wh whether a P is aspirated or not doesn't make a difference in the meaning of a word. But in other languages, it does. Other languages mm -hmm. actually exploit this distinction so that pot, you know, pot versus pot, I mean, I can barely say it without aspirating the P yeah. sound, um, just because it's sort of a part of my, the rules of the phonology of my language. Um, you know, those would be two completely different words mm -hmm. to another speaker who actually cuts up the way that consonant sounds happen in their head mm -hmm. in a different way from how an English speaker does it. Okay. So a, a person's natural language, right. we start out as babies doing all kinds of gibberish. We then learn how to, how to, we whittle that away. Yeah. And we start associating words with things. Yeah. Yeah. And we develop a natural language. And so we speak this natural language. We develop it as, as a child. Then there are pigeons. Mm which are, are not so much a natural language, but a pigeon is when two people that have speak different languages come together and are forced to cooperate. Yeah. And they start to invent a mixture of the two. Yeah. So um, maybe we can sort of work our way up from a pigeon and what that is to what an actual full natural language is. Yeah. Uh, and then maybe look at a specific example. So yeah. um, as you mentioned, there are sort of, there have been these historical contexts where disparate linguistic communities have been forced together for, usually pretty bad reasons like the slave trade. Yeah. Um, but they end up being forced into, cir into circumstances where they have to communicate with each other somehow. And right. so usually you get this cobbled together system of various aspects of each of their languages mm -hmm. um, pooled together and turned into this relatively simple communication mechanism. I say relatively simple because it will use, again, the, the sounds and languages that are more common as, as opposed to the ones that are more rare. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it, it's sentence structure to the extent that it has sentence structure is much more simple. You're probably not going to find a lot of embedded clauses, you know, sentences yeah. inside sentences inside sentences, uh, which you can normally do with language, but which is certainly a burden cognitively. So, so in a pigeon, I might say coffee, me, drink. Sure. Yeah. And you, the, the, the two people or the two groups would start, developing a super simple kind of like caveman language. Yeah, I mean, maybe to, to, to talk about some of the things it would lack, you know, it would lack things like tense, it would mm -hmm. lack things like agreement. So the interaction that you find in languages between a verb and its subject or a verb and its mm -hmm. object where they change their shape or their pronunciation, um, depending on what role semantically they're playing in the sentence. Mm -hmm. um, uh, they lack aspect. So that's sort of a way that we uh, talk about the relationship of events with one another. Mm -hmm. um, they lack, you know, articles, they lack case. I mean, there's all kinds of things that you don't find in a pigeon that you do tend to find in natural languages. Um, maybe I could yeah. focus in on a particular example here. That's yeah. actually, a, it's a nice case of, of actually being able to watch a language uh, come into existence. So um, in the, late 1970s, uh, 
um, in, Nicaragua, in Nicaragua, you didn't have much of a deaf community. Um, yeah. You had deaf people living in separate homes, but not really interacting with each other very yeah. much. Um, and so at, at most, um, the level of communication they had with their families was something that you might call home sign, uh, mm -hmm. a, a variety of communication, which is sign language like, but which again, doesn't really have a lot of the features that a full working sign language has. Again, the things we talked yeah. about, like tense and agreement. And, and, and sign accent. language is a full natural language. Yeah, I mean, as, be, as an aside, it's maybe worth mentioning that yeah. sign languages, I think people get maybe a little bit misled here, that think that they're just sort of coded versions of existing languages, mm -hmm. but they're otherwise basically the same. So yeah. people might think ASL, American Sign Language, is just kind of American English, but with uh, manu gestures. manual gestures instead of, uh, you know, um, vocalizations, that's not really the case. I mean, there mm -hmm. are hundreds of sign languages across the world and they're largely independent, if not totally independent yeah. of, of spoken language. Um, so what, what it, something interesting happened in the late seventies, which is um, a school for the deaf was established in Nicaragua. Mm -hmm. uh, and the intended uh, purpose of the school was to teach them Spanish through lip reading. Uh, so it wasn't actually to teach them uh, sort of a full sign language. Yeah but it kind of ended up happening anyway. So mm -hmm. basically uh, th there wasn't a lot of success in teaching them Spanish, but what the kids did is out in the playground or out in the streets, they developed this communication <laughs> system by pooling, again, pooling together their resources from their various home sign systems mm -hmm. and creating, again, something that was fairly pigeon-like. It, it didn't necessarily have the full gamut of, of linguistic properties, mm -hmm. um, but, Interestingly enough, when when this was around long enough and the older kids began to pass it on to the younger kids, I mean, you could sort of think about what was happening there as passing or filtering an input through a young mind that was still in the process of acquiring a language. Um, and I, I use the word acquire here very mm -hmm. deliberately because, you know, again, there can be this tendency to think that we teach each other language. Um, the truth is linguistic systems, when you start to study them, they're, mm -hmm. they're incredibly complicated. And there's there's no sensible way in which we could think of them as being actually consciously passed on from one speaker to another. Yeah. Um, the truth is that they're acquired in the sense that children are exposed to particular language and then basically derive from that input um, a replication of what was in the mind of their of the speaker that they learned it from yeah. uh, or an approximation of it, right? So in most cases, this means a children acquires a language from their parents. Um, yeah. But in the case of this Nicaraguan sign language, what was in it, what ended up happening is younger children were exposed to a pigeon, which is not quite a full language, but our, our propensity as human beings, especially when we're younger, to impose patterns and structure on the world mm -hmm. is so strong that the language ends up getting regularized or the technical term here is creolized it, be yeah. it becomes a creole language which is a natural language it is yeah. a full language um so for example i was mentioning the fact that pigeons lack something like verbal agreement so you don't have much of this in english but just to give people a sense of what that means uh, i say he sleeps right versus he sleep um mm -hmm. contrast with you sleep versus you sleeps right so you get you get this slight change on the verb depending mm -hmm. on the subject of the sentence um and and you and find pigeons do not have that. Pigeons in tend not to yeah. have this, but the kids actually started injecting verbal agreement into mm -hmm. the language. So um, so the really young kids still at, at language acquiring age, they would see this pigeon being spoken by older kids. Basically, yeah. And they would invent deeper rules. Yeah, to yeah. That, to that system. Uh, and this is fascinating to linguists because it's an opportunity for one to see language creation in action. Mm -hmm. um, but more than that, it's an opportunity to look at a new language, the birth of a new language, and try and, and figure out what are the essential properties of language? Mm -hmm. What is it that the kids are adding into the system that's maybe not fully there in the input, but they're putting it in there anyway. Uh, and then if they have their own kids, then they pass it on and their kids speak this Creole language as well. Yeah. Um, and, and that's a natural language. I mean, one, uh, you know, the, the punchline here is that you can think of a natural language as linguistic input, whether it's it's full and rich or whether it's impoverished in the form of a pigeon, mm -hmm. 
gets filtered through the mind of a child who's in the process of acquiring a language and in turn becomes a natural language. Yeah. Um, so even with Esperanto, which we mentioned was a constructed language, um, you know, a certain degree of thought was put into its construction, but it, it, it in effect became a natural language because people did raise their children speaking Esperanto. So the that's, language got, cool. again, it got filtered through the mind of children. Um, yeah, so I mean, in, in yeah. effect, it, it's become a natural language. This to me and to most linguists is evidence that there is something innate about language because right. you give you give kids a, a half half produced language and they create a full language out of it. Yeah, with all the different rules and stuff that yeah. things like English and French have. Yeah, and, and these are these are rules that you would think took multiple generations to establish, but kids are doing it immediately yeah and with just a, by being young yeah just yeah. by being young <laughs> um and it, it doesn't necessarily require conscious effort mm -hmm. on their part it, it, they're probably you know i doubt if you had a conversation with the speakers of the younger speakers of nick Rupp and sign language that they would be able to tell you about verbal agreement i mean right. again that that's a level of awareness of your own language that you usually only acquire through formal instruction yeah. or you know spending enough time at home thinking about it by yourself to figure it out but but when adults come together they only create pigeons they don't create full languages um yeah yeah i mean um it, i you know you don't want to rule out the the possibility i mean certainly people uh, when they're adults, they can acquire uh, a second language, mm -hmm. um, right? So, you know, we're, we're kind of getting into the domain of how easy it is to uh, create and or learn a language uh, when you're older versus when you're younger. Yeah. And there's definitely a difference there. Mm -hmm. um, there's a difference in terms of ease and speed. Um, I don't know that there's necessarily a super sharp cutoff point, uh, but there's definitely a, a decline. Um, yeah. Uh, you know, linguists talk about a, a sensitive period or mm -hmm. or a or a sort of um, a, a critical period where if you're if you're a child and you're not exposed to language within that particular period, uh, basically we're talking about before puberty, um, you're going to have a much tougher time acquiring your first language. Mm -hmm. um, and, and also, you know, the, the same goes with second language acquisition. Even if you've successfully acquired a first language. Um, if you're if you're now past puberty, it can be a lot more difficult to acquire a second language than let's say if you were grew up multilingual. Yeah. Um, so I when I was in college, I met a girl from Cape Verde, and this this is a set of islands has a horrible history. It was where the slave trade. It, it's ten islands off the east coast of Africa, and the Portuguese who were running the slave trade there they broke up each island into multiple camps mm. and they would when there was a war between groups in africa they would purchase the losing uh, nations and then they would take them to these islands and they would separate anyone who spoke the same language they'd separate them on different islands this wow. is this is her telling me this yeah, so right. i haven't I've never like really dove into their history but sure and then they break them into different camps so that essentially nobody could speak the same language as anyone else there, right. and then they would break them and prepare these, you know, normal proud humans to become slaves. Yeah, it's right. an absolutely horrible process. But she is a descendant of that. Yeah. So obviously there was a lot of people that were kept there on these yeah. islands, and they ended up revolting eventually. I think it was really recently that they gained independence yeah. from the Portuguese. I think it was like the seventies. Oh wow! Okay. Um, Very recent. But they, she spoke Portuguese Creole. And I, I, I speak Portuguese. I lived in Brazil right, for several yeah, years. Yeah. And so her and I became really good friends. Yeah. But it was really interesting having because she learned proper Portuguese at school, mm. but she spoke this Creole, yeah. which was a mix of a bunch of different African languages mm. and Portuguese. Yeah. And and yeah, it was a completely naturalized language. Everybody on the island speaks the same Creole. And it's a full on legitimate language, mm -hmm. but it started out as a pigeon. Yeah. So this transition yeah. from, you know, pigeon to a, a natural language, a natural Creole is, is really fascinating to me. And it, it was it was so cool to listen to her speak Portuguese yeah. and then speak her native tongue. Yeah, I mean, it's fascinating to, to linguists too. It, it offers a very unique uh, peak that we otherwise don't get yeah. um, into the, the language acquisition and, and language generation uh, process. Yeah. Um, it, it was also striking 
listening to her stories as to how mm. important language is. I mean, that right. that was a key. The Portuguese found that that was key in breaking a human soul is yeah. to make it so they can't speak. Well, it's such a fundamental part of our identity. I right. mean, that, that's another um, sort of barrier to studying a language is um, recognizing how close you are to it and trying to distance yourself from it to right. approach it from a scientific perspective. Right. It can be tough, yeah. So let's talk about Coco. So All right. people want to say that Coco is speaking American Sign Language. Sure, yeah. How is that true? How is that not true? Yeah. What What is the difference? Um, yeah, yeah. So uh, basically, it's highly controversial, the idea that Coco the Gorilla actually uh, spoke or let's say used sign language, American Sign Language. Um, and I think, I think part of the confusion over this comes from again, not realizing that language isn't just a bag of words, right? It's right. it's actually um, a, a full system of rules that um, govern how those words are combined and um, how they're put together and what sorts of elements are added to them. Mm -hmm. um, so when you actually look at the kinds of utterances or the kinds of productions, let's say, is a better way of putting it that Coco was producing, mm -hmm. I mean, for sure, Coco learned, uh, maybe it was in the hundreds, maybe even the thousands of signs, mm -hmm. uh, individual signs. Yeah. Um, you know, so there we're talking about an association between, you know, let's say real world objects or relationships and, um, and then manual dexterity. So particular movements being done mm -hmm. with the hands. Um, that in and of itself is is not really a language, right? I mean, language is so much more than that. It, language is about the order that the words come in yeah. um, and the kinds of uh, grammatical extra bits that are sprinkled into it and on top of it. Um, and and the ability to, to construct novel sentences, right? Well, yeah, so it you know you you can talk about um, this also in terms of how how language is is used. So I think, uh, maybe we could look at it from the perspective of how easy it is for a child to acquire language, which is to say, we don't have to do anything to make it happen. It just yeah. happens. Um, versus a, a lot of these instances of trying to teach non-human primates languages are involving mm -hmm. teams of scientists desperately trying to get this animal to, um, in some way, achieve a human level of linguistic communication. It's incredibly difficult. Uh, it never seems to achieve quite the level of linguistic communication that you and I have. Um, and the end state, yeah, the end state never seems to be quite there. Um, yeah. I, again, I mean, y y for sure you found um, uh, Coco as well as, you know, chimpanzees that had been taught um, uh, various versions or various degrees of sign language. You found these sort of, they would juxtapose signs, they would combine them. Whether that was truly linguistic or whether it was something more um, sort of behavioristic or conditional in nature, that's tough to tease out, right? It's yeah. tough to know that, well, maybe all that's really happening here is they know that, they know that if they put this sign together with this sign, they'll, they'll get food or they'll yeah. get water. Um, but, but she was able to say, I want, yeah, sure. and then you taught her one phrase, I want food, I yeah. want to, I want whatever. Yeah. But then she was able to, to understand, oh, I want kitty. Mm -hmm. And so she could say, I want kitty, even though she was never taught, I want kitty as a phrase. Right. Yeah, I think so. Another reason why it's it's controversial to make that particular leap is, um, I don't know if you've ever heard uh, or if your audience has heard of the case of Clever Hans, which was this horse that was supposed to be able to do rudimentary <laughs> arithmetic. Mm -hmm. So the, the basic story was that this, this guy was supposedly, he supposedly had a horse that you could throw the horse a couple of numbers, like two and three, and then it would use its hoof to kind of tap out the answer. Yeah. Turned out that when you actually examined the case closely, the horse was using cues from the guy. In other yeah. words, the guy was doing the arithmetic. Yeah. Yeah. The horse was just kind of following along with what the guy wanted the horse to do, mm -hmm. and it made it look like the horse was doing math. Um, with respect to these novel combinations of of signs like I want kitty, yeah. I don't think it's entirely clear that that's not what was going on, that mm -hmm. there wasn't this um, incredible, incredibly strong link between the researcher mm -hmm. and the gorilla to elicit a particular response. Mm -hmm. And I mean, it, it's a, another thing that's important to point out here is that um, language is, uh, one of this characteristic 
features of language is, is that it's very much stimulus independent. So we produce all kinds of utterances and we ask questions without necessarily there being some obvious stimulus out there in the world, other than our own mind yeah. leading us to that statement or that right. question. Um, and you, you don't really see that in these um, uh, cases of, of non-human primate signing, uh, where there were these spontaneous questions or these spontaneous utterances that mm -hmm. didn't really clearly involve um, or, or in some way involve uh, the, the researcher maybe eliciting this response. So, so you know, it, it, if I look at a chimpanzee trying to get food, for example, they're going to go through a whole set of things like, you know, they can invent this, they can have a stick and put it in to get termites and all that. Mm. So they're, they're constructing a whole series of uh, behaviors yeah, right. to get an end result. Yeah, you can it, get pretty complex. And it would seem like Coco is doing the same thing with words. Maybe, yeah. But if I'm understanding correctly, there, there is a big difference between that and what we're doing because we're kind of using language to help our organize our own thoughts. It's part of it, yeah, for to sure. Help, to help uh, navigate ideas. It's also fundamentally a very social activity. I mean, yeah. most of, when you actually measure what it is people talk about, like two thirds of it is other people. Right. It's basically right. gossip. Yeah. I mean, it, 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 we've sort of co-opted it to be used as, as a system of complex propositional knowledge communication. Like we yeah. can build rocket ships and go to Mars um, yeah. using language. Um, but it's it maybe not clear that that's what it's usually used for, or even what it was originally used for. Right. Uh, it's possible that just that just ended up being a really handy um, uh, sort of side effect of it. Yeah, yeah. It it really is interesting to try and tease out these differences. And I know that the research is, as you mentioned, that this field is young. Yeah. Uh, there is some research going on in the United States with bonobos right now. Mm where they're using symbols on, I think it's on like an iPad or something. Oh, really? Okay, I don't know And And these chimp, or I think it's bonobos, mm. they're, they're seeing how much construction they can actually do mm. with these symbols. Yeah. And it is seeming like they're able to figure it out better than we thought mm. just with um, mm -hmm. just with the experiments with Coco because yeah. the, the, experience the experiments with Coco weren't very well controlled because you only had one Specimen that, doing, right. Yeah. Yeah. One data point um, is not a great way to do science. Yeah. Yeah. And you had, you really only had in the start, I'm forgetting the scientist's name. Um, I apologize, but she, she was, you know, she was like the only one doing this. Yeah. yeah. And now, now we've got this laboratory that's, yeah. that's uh, investigating this more with, with multiple researchers studying these, this group of bonobos. Right. Uh, so I think we're going to get some more information about this to, to really be able to tease out the differences. Yeah, but. yeah. I, I certainly wouldn't want to underestimate the intelligence of non-human animals. Yeah. Um, my point would be to not underestimate the complexity of language. I think. Right. I think unless people have spent at least a little bit of time studying it, you know, whether it's reading a book or taking an introductory course mm -hmm. or what have you, or watching our YouTube channel, uh, yeah. the Link Space. Yeah. Um, the Link Space. It's, it can be hard to actually even imagine uh, how how complicated it really gets, and, and you know. We, yeah. we can we can certainly get into that, um, but m maybe a nice way to cap off this part of the conversation would just be to mention that uh, if if you actually just turn to uh, a, a human speaker or a human user of ASL, and you ask them, you know, sign language, yeah, 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 what was what Coca the gorilla was doing? Was that anything like what you do? And the answer is an unequivocal no. That's yeah. nothing like sign language. Um, so, you know, I mean, I, I would default to their judgment <laughs> on that one. But it would be similar to a pigeon, right? Uh, I mean, she's, she's basically just like in a, in a pigeon, I, I might say um, money, uh, quantity, food, like if, if I'm at a restaurant. Maybe. Um, I, it, there, may, there may be subtle ways in which it's not, though. So I think it's not even entirely clear how uh, discreet um, the signs of Coco word. By discrete here, I mean that you can clearly differentiate one sign from another or or from what other kinds of manual movements were occurring before and after. Whereas, again, another one of these distinguishing features of language is mm -hmm. that it's fundamentally discrete. You know, we have um, sounds that are categorized by our minds, even if the, the variable in the acoustic signal is continuous. Um, we, we break sentences up into words, we parse a sentence, yeah. and we sort of figure out on the fly what its structure is. Um, and, and again, this is not something you see in the signal, 
Um, when you actually look at a recording of speech and a visual representation of speech, it's not like you see the words. Um, mm -hmm. And yet our minds are, are immediately imposing this, this structure onto our, our utterances. Uh, and I don't think it's entirely clear that um, what's, what's going on in, in, in signed languages as used by as non-human primates is really discrete in the way that that language is. It, it may be yeah. more continuous. Yeah. We got a couple of questions sure. that are interesting here. Um, actually, my brother asks, mm. does learning two languages as a child make it hard to be completely fluent in either of them? Or can a child learn two languages as fluently as just one language if taught them from birth? Mm. Yeah, so I, it's not really my wheelhouse, to be honest with you, but um, my basic understanding with respect to raising children uh, bilingually or, or multilingually is that um, I think fears of, of not uh, fully acquiring one or the other language are, are overblown. Yeah. And in fact, I think it goes in the opposite direction. I think it's it's demonstrably true that children that have been raised bilingually or trilingually, et cetera, mm -hmm. actually have an advantage in terms of, of having that much more metalinguistic awareness. So awareness of a language as an object yeah. of study, you know, you, because you have the opportunity to compare two or more languages and actually think about what the differences are, what right. the similarities are. Um, and that can only be a good thing, right? <laughs> right, right. Uh, well, one of the things in his question, he talks about being taught uh, different languages from birth, but what you're saying is that language is not taught, it's acquired. Yeah, I mean, obviously we don't, I mean, so it's it, maybe this could transition into what happens when we aren't exposed to linguistic input, but in most normal cases, human beings are exposed to a certain degree of input, which they then turn into a fully functioning language. I mean, language is in its essence reinvented with every new generation, although often the, the replication is so close that we don't notice changes except over long distances of time. Uh, so from, you know, a parents to their, to their children, um, the differences aren't enormous. You can pick up on them, but it, the, the two languages are still mutually intelligible. Yeah. Uh, but when you separate people out over, let's say a thousand years, you lose that intelligibility. So, yeah. you know, I, I it's, it's kind of neat just to, I would encourage people like, maybe not right now, but once the video is over, go over to YouTube and check out someone reading the first few lines of Beowulf in the original oh, yeah. Old English. It's completely different from the way English is today. And it, it gives you, a, you know, it gets the imagination going about what's what's English going to be like in another thousand years. Right. Um, now, things are different because we have we have recordings of English now yeah. that may end up maintaining the language to a degree that it wasn't maintained purely through writing. Uh, so maybe it won't change as much, or maybe it'll be supplanted by another lingua franca. Yeah. Um, well, okay, so I, I wanna talk about accents real quick here, okay. because people a lot of times, I, you know, I'm from Oregon, and I kind of speak like a, someone from California, and people will say that I don't have an accent, and that someone from Tennessee does have an accent. <laughs> Everyone and, thinks they and, have the, and, the, uh, the neutral yeah, version of the language. Yeah. I think that's really the funny, but, but, but first, um, I got a really interesting question. Do the vocal cords work more constrained as we get older? So, hmm. you know, we're whittling down the, the, the things that we're capable of understanding, you yeah, know, right. as, we, as we learn a language, we go from total gibberish to just, you know, what our language speaks. Yeah. Does that affect our vocal cords? That's an interesting question. I don't know if that's been studied. Um, I mean, certainly people's voices change over the course of their life, yeah. uh, over their lifetime, right? A children's or a child's speech is much more high pitched than an adult's, uh, in part because their vocal cords are smaller and they have yeah. a smaller lung capacity. Uh, as you grow older, your lung capacity grows, your, your vocal cords get bigger mm -hmm. and thicker and your, uh, your vocal range tends to lower, your, your overall pitch tends to go down. Um, I would, I, if I had to guess, I would probably say that as you as you age, your vocal cords age along with you, which is yeah. to say they they probably lose things like elasticity, mm -hmm. um, and that I mean certainly if you listen to older people speak versus younger people, just in terms of the pitch of their voice, the quality of it, I mean even yeah. if you can't see their face, you can usually distinguish an older voice from a younger voice. Yeah. Uh, so I would I would imagine that probably associates with a, a change in the physiology and the right. biology, but well, well I would say so. I mean this question is does the language that you speak change how your vocal cords can work? And I would say absolutely yes. Um, it's just like exercise. Anything that you, you know, the muscles that you use determine how your body is built, you know, as you get older. I, I was talking to a, a, a doctor once who was complaining about these 
have you seen these uh, barefoot shoes where all your toes are oh, yeah, originally? Right. Um, he was saying that he got a lot of people in with foot problems after using those. And the the marketing ploys that you know we evolved to run barefoot. So oh. you should you should be running barefoot right, now. Right. Yeah. And the doctor was telling me your feet actually transform to wear shoes if you've been wearing shoes for, since right, we were a little right. kid. Yeah. Our bodies are very plastic. We mm. so I I think it's absolutely true that the muscles, the specific muscles you use in your vocal cords and in your tongue for the language that you've been taught or that, that you've acquired. Yeah. That's going to determine the strength of those movements of your tongue yeah. and your vocal cords. Oh, yeah. I, I think I would just qualify yeah. that, that it, it probably has a lot. So, you know, when you actually look at how language is mechanically produced, um, it, w what tends to make one language different from another or one system of sounds different from another isn't really tied too much to the vocal cords. Um, so all the all the vocal cords really do is you force air through them while keeping them taut yeah. so that they they vibrate. Um, and it's really what we do with that vibration that mm -hmm. differentiates one language from another. So the position of the teeth, the tongue, the lips, the, the velum, which is the yeah. soft palate, which either allows or blocks air going through the nose. Um, these are all the ways in which we can articulate different sounds. Um, obviously, we do play with the, the, the vocal cords a little. Um, we can make certain kinds of distinctions using them, but they're, they're pretty specific mm -hmm. in terms of, of what they do from one language to the next, which is yeah. basically they vibrate. And then we do something with that uh, yeah. to make one vowel sound different from another, one consonant sound different from another. So, I mean, phoneticians uh, or, or acoustic phoneticians have this sort of source filter theory of how voice, uh, how the voice is produced, yeah. where um, the source is really the lungs and the vocal cords. And then the filter is the rest of our, yeah. our sort of peripheral speech system. But yeah, that, that is interesting. When I was in Brazil, I, I really think that everyone should learn a second language and should travel to a foreign country or just go hang out with foreigners in your own country because you, you, you notice so many weird things. And I don't even know if what I'm about to say is true about English or not, but I noticed that in Brazil, um, people would speak high pitched. Um, and it, it was almost kind of a, a status for, for males. You would speak higher pitched if you were kind of lower status and mm -hmm. you would speak lower pitched if you were higher status oh, that's interesting and i would see this especially with politicians they'd, they'd be purposely speaking low right. to make themselves sound bigger yeah um oh yeah and, yeah, and right. but but i noticed the opposite like men who who were very timid would speak at an artificially high pitched tone mm -hmm. and i wonder if we do that in english and this is something that i would you know i'm like do we do that too or yeah i mean that, that's it? sort of an interesting sociolinguistic question it, it, it's always good to ask what are we sig signaling with the language we right. use and and what what is our position in society with respect to how we're using our language um i don't know too much about that uh but yeah. uh yeah uh, i mean I, I would say one thing one thing that, that you, what everything you said made me think of was just that uh linguists do tend to think of uh the lowering of the larynx which is the voice box voice box, which is the massive cartilage that contains the vocal cords. Right. They think of that, that lower lowering that is in, a, in an evolutionary sense. So versus our, our, our ancestors as being a precursor to language. Mm -hmm. um, basically the lower the larynx gets, the more space we have to play around with and filter. Oh. Um, mm -hmm. And so the more different sounds we can produce with a language. Um, but it's, it's not necessarily clear that the lowering of the larynx evolved for language right. um, because it, it's it also serves the purpose of actually making us seem bigger so basically mm. the lower the larynx uh the lower the pitch and then ah. you you kind of get this sense of of larger size yeah um, that's interesting yeah. all right so before i forget i'm getting a lot of i'm getting too many interesting questions this okay. is really good i a lot of times when i do these videos i don't get enough questions okay. so this is this means people are interested this is cool um but I want to talk about this accents thing. Okay. And this, the evolution of accents and the, the evolution of the meaning of word. You talked about Beowulf. If you were to hear Beowulf being read in its original Eng English, you wouldn't even be able to understand it. You might be able to read it now and oh, understand yeah. it. Maybe. But um, this, this, this issue of the Southern accent, a lot, of, a lot of times in America, people associate a Southern accent with people that are uneducated. Mm. Tell us why that's wrong. Oh, well, I mean, <laughs> yeah, 
what can I say about that? Um, maybe here what I'll say is that uh, you're right. People do have this subjective sense that certain accents are associated with certain classes, uh, you know, whether it's socioeconomic or 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 what have you. Um, and I mean, unsurprisingly, uh, people then hear that dialect of English or that particular language that's associated with that lower social class as being either a substandard version of their language or their dialect um, or somehow wrong or worse or broken or what have you. Um, I mean, there's, there's, this has no objective reality in linguistics. Yeah. So, um, you know, as far as linguists are concerned, there's no obvious way in which different dialects or different languages are really better or worse than each other. Yeah. Um, you can talk about the differences, uh, but often it's more just a matter of a kind of trade-off. So mm -hmm. um, some languages may be, let's say, simpler in one sense and more complex in another. So, you know, you can count how many vowel sounds a, a language or a dialect has. Yeah. Um, and if a language has fewer vowel sounds, it doesn't necessarily follow that it's simpler than another language that has more vowel sounds. Um, they may be introducing complexity in some other way. You know, maybe they have a more sophisticated mm -hmm. case system, a more sophisticated morphology. Uh, yeah. They have more tenses than, than we do in English, let's say. Yeah. Um, well, okay, so people that speak my dialect of English, we when we hear someone say, I don't got no, whatever, uh -huh. we hear this double negative, oh, and yeah, we right. think that's an indication that you're not very smart or you're using an right. inferior form of the language. Yeah. And the really interesting thing about French is that double negatives are the formal way to speak. Mm -hmm. So it, you're supposed to use double negatives. Yeah. Like, je ne parle pas français. Yeah, right. <laughs> um, I, I, how do you even translate that directly into English? Um, uh, well, usually the way it's 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 translated by linguists. So je ne parle pas français. Uh, I ne speak not French. I mean, <laughs> yeah. the ne is not really even translated because yeah. uh, we don't really have uh, an analog in in English. The secondary negative particle right. uh, particle here is just a word for I don't know what it is. So I'm going to call it a particle. Yeah. <laughs> maybe ain't. Uh, yeah, yeah, we do. I well, ain't I mean, got no. <laughs> I'm, I'm, so maybe it's worth getting a, a little bit into this um, because I, I, so there's this sense that um, let's say something like double negation is illogical, uh, right? That it doesn't make sense to use two negative words in a sense because they cancel each other out and it becomes positive. Um, Again, I would point out the fact that, you know, speakers of dialects of English that don't obviously have a double negative actually have an analogous phenomenon that they're just not aware of. So there, there, are, there are these words called negative polarity items, which mm -hmm. sounds really fancy, um, NPI for short. Uh, and they're words like ever and any uh, and certain idioms like give a damn. So I might say I don't give a damn, but it sounds a little bit weird to say I do give a damn, except in a particular yeah. context. Uh, or you can say I didn't ever do that, uh, but it sounds a little bit weird to say I did ever do that. Um, yeah. So yeah. You, you get these words that pattern with negation. Um, or, you know, I didn't see anything versus I did see anything. Uh, you might say I did see something. That's sort of the more right. natural way to put it. So you get this switch from some to any when you put negation uh, into the sentence. And that's essentially what's happening with double negation in other dialects of, of mm -hmm. English. It's just that instead of, of any, let's say, um, you, get some, you get something like no. So I didn't see nothing, yeah. right, versus I didn't see anything. It's the same phenomenon, or it's very, very similar. It's just that in English, it's not obvious that it's a case of double negation because any doesn't really sound anything like no or not. Yeah. Whereas in, in I didn't see nothing, it's more obvious that the no in nothing is related to the not in didn't. Yeah. Um, so you, you get these patterns which again, people don't even realize exist and, and can't even really, it's, it's actually kind of challenging to describe the pattern. It, it's tricky to explain, you know, why is it that we could say something like, um, uh, everyone, uh, uh, let me see if I can construct this sentence. So um, every, or everyone who's ever thought about this um, has read a book about it. That's That yeah. sounds okay. Um, but it sounds weird to say, um, everyone who thought about this has read any book about it. Like, 
suddenly when you move the negative polarity item, or in this case, I switch the negative polarity item from ever to any and mm -hmm. put it at the end of the sentence instead of the beginning, you go from a good sounding, or you, yeah, you go from a good sounding sentence to a bad sounding sentence. Why? Well, we do have an explanation for that, but it well requires, you know, several minutes in a whiteboard. <laughs> yeah. um, but yeah. you, can, you can certainly go to our channel and have a look at our, our yeah. episode on negative polarity items and that might interest you as well. Yeah. So the, uh, Essentially, kind of, kind of what I want to drive home here is that the accent that you use, all languages evolve, they emerge uh, within a culture, and they, they evolve and emerge from this, there's this biological aspect that all of us are kind of set up to be able to create languages. And so the different dialect that you happen to speak really has nothing to do with how intelligent you are. It's just cultural associations. So. Yeah. We might we might notice that people that don't learn never learn how to read often talk this way yeah. because they weren't reading, you know, formal English like like we were, and so you'll associate that with someone who's illiterate. Yeah, if it had um, been the other way around, it would have been the other way around. Right. So if if quote unquote formal English uh, said things like I didn't see nothing, and it was the lower status version of language that said I didn't see anything, yeah. then we would we would think of I didn't see anything as being of, of low prestige or of low quality or, or a worse kind of English. And we would right. decry how illogical it is. Right. Why would you say any when you can just say no? <laughs> it's a, this is really just normal human prejudices being yeah, a, a, on the a, language. A, the justifications that tend to be put forward for why one version of a language is better or worse than another, often fall apart under scrutiny, maybe always fall apart under scrutiny. Yeah. And a surprise, surprise, usually just fall along cultural and political lines, yeah. um, predictably. Yeah. Um, let's see, I've got a question about, um, is there a specific region of the brain responsible for for language, I'm not sure if that's something you would know about, but I, I could just briefly address it and mm -hmm. say that yeah, there are a couple of regions of the brain. So, uh, for one, language is highly lateralized. Um, mm -hmm. In most people, it's realized in the, the left hemisphere as opposed mm -hmm. to the right, and it's also highly localized in a couple of areas. Um, uh, what's known as Broca's area, uh, after the researcher, um, yeah. I forget his first name, but Broca, um, as well as Wernicke's area, again, named after a researcher. Uh, Broca's area seems to be highly correlated with certain kinds of uh, grammatical aspects of speech, especially uh, people with damage to Broca's area have a lot of, have a hard time understanding passive sentences. Yeah. Um, uh, damage to Wernicke's area uh, seems to relate more to meaning as opposed to grammar or structure. Uh, so yeah, you do find these um, pretty tight correlations between certain brain areas and certain aspects of language. Yeah. I got another question. Will we want to be able to fully understand animal language and communicate with them? And I hope to, so. To that, yeah, I mean, it seems like it should be doable, but there's some really interesting things about this. Um, I was... I was reading, it was like a popular article. It wasn't a scientific research article, but so I don't even know how accurate this is, but there was some sort of experiment with dolphins mm. that seemed to suggest that they can actually communicate three-dimensional objects with each other. Oh, in I a think I did chair. hear about this. Yeah, yeah, right, right. I did hear about this, yeah. Because they see with sound, they right. use their sonar. Right. And so if, depending on how right. good they are at imitating sounds, they could also chirp that image to each yeah, other yeah. in an instant, which is really cool. Instant file transfer, yeah. And for us to be able to learn how to do that would be, ooh, that would be complicated. But I suppose we've already got sonar systems. So you could, we could probably get a sonar system to talk to another sonar system. Well, yeah, I mean, that's, that's what we do with technology. Um, we supplement our bodies um, with, with the things they yeah. can do through, through our own invention. Yeah. <laughs> but so much of animal communication is with, gestures and you know like a dog barks and the bark sounds pretty much the same all the time you've got different squeaks and other things like this and obviously there's information in that and the dogs are understanding each other mm. at some level to a degree yeah. according to these sounds but uh for the most part with dogs it's smells and it's uh posture yeah. and it's i mean not those not that those things are unimportant yeah. for humans but uh, again a uh, you know a bark is very different from a, a language with a, a million word vocabulary right. and a sophisticated system of 
grammar that can in principle generate an infinite number of sentences, yeah. each of which communicates a completely different idea. <laughs> right, right. And, and the fact that we're so good at communicating through writing or through telephone, that kind of suggests how dependent we've become on language as opposed to body gestures. Absolutely. And, and, yeah, that's um, a good point. Yeah. Uh, because we, we really can understand someone's mind by reading what they wrote or understand yeah, I mean, the idea in someone's mind. Yeah, I mean, just look look around you, all the technology around you, the buildings, the the civilization that you live in as a whole, really wouldn't be able to, to have gotten there, gotten off the ground without being able to transmit um, complex information and accumulate knowledge through history. Yeah. I, I got a question. Um, what are Stefan's thoughts on the Sapper Wharf hypothesis mm, of your native right. native language altering your thinking patterns. Yeah, right. So I guess uh, briefly, um, like the, the the case with Coco the gorilla or, or other um, instances of non-human um, animals communicating uh, in apparently linguistic ways, um, linguists are pretty skepti skeptical of stronger forms of the Sapir mm. Wharf hypothesis. So in this case, the stronger form of the Sapir Wharf hypothesis is named after. Uh, Benjamin Lee Worf and Edward Sapir, two researchers at the beginning of the 20th century, uh, looking at language. Um, the basic idea is that in the strong form, the hypothesis says that uh, our, our experience and our perception of the world is fundamentally constrained by the language we speak. Um, a weaker form might just say that it's influenced by the yeah. language that we speak. And I think without a doubt, there's a lot of um, uh, experimental data that, that shows that um, yes, languages do, the language you speak, the vocabulary that you have does at least nudge your perception in one direction or another. You can sort of measure this in experiments. Um, those nudges tend to be really, really small. So, you know, we're, you know, in terms of, um, let's say color perception where, um, a, a language like Russian makes, uh, different, uh, lexical distinctions between different shades of blue versus English, which doesn't. So, um, maybe yeah. maybe the equivalent would be the fact that we have word we we have a word for red and a word for pink, mm -hmm. um, but we uh, don't really have words for different shades of blue. We just have to say things like light blue and dark blue. Right. Uh, whereas Russian actually does make this distinction more pronounced, um, and you can actually measure uh, the speed with which a Russian speaker can distinguish between different colors. Um, but the, the measurement is usually on the order of milliseconds, right? right? So the idea that it's fundamentally changing the way they see the world, that seems to be a, a bit of a, a leap. Yeah. Um, and again, you know, it might also be just worth with mentioning again that language is more than just a bag of words, right? I mean, language is primarily this big, giant, complex grammatical system. Um, and I mean, there, there have been attempts to try and show that that influences thought. Um, in, in a fundamental way, there was an economist a few years back by the name of Keith Chen, who, uh, whose research basically claimed that the way that different languages mark tense, uh, that is future versus past versus mm -hmm. present, actually influenced saving behavior really? and, and uh, like, like money, yeah. right? And he did a pretty good job of controlling for all the variables you'd want to control for yeah. right? You want to filter out culture in this context, which is hard to do because oh, yeah. languages oh, are usually yeah. very tied to a particular culture. Yeah. But he did a pretty good job to his credit. Um, it still wasn't convincing, not to me and not to a lot of linguists, that um, this th that I think his idea was basically that languages which didn't mark the future tense uh, actually had speakers that were better able to save because they didn't draw this distinction between the here and now and the later. Mm. Whereas um, speakers who, who did make a distinction between the future and the present, uh, somehow they, you know, cleaving time in this way meant that they, the future was conceptually more distant and really? they wouldn't save for it. Um, I, I don't, it's, it's hard to buy because for yeah. one, the way that he ended up categorizing languages in terms of which ones had future tense and which one didn't, really line up with the way that linguists the way categorize the way that languages do or do not mark the future yeah. um for one thing it's worth saying that and any language can talk about the future and they do it in different ways but it's not as though there are languages where people have no idea what's going on in the yeah. future it just doesn't exist um and and moreover you know in english for instance doesn't actually have a future tense proper. It, it uses a, a modal verb like will or would mm -hmm. to talk about the future. Um, this is versus the past tense, uh, which is a, a, a suffix that you add, right? Kick versus kicked, the ed right. suffix at the end uh, turns 
turns a verb into the past tense. Um, so we do future a little bit different in English. Uh, we don't really have future tense per se, but in, in Keith Chen's research, he categorized English as being a futured language that is yeah. having future tense. And I, I don't know, so his categorizations were odd. Um, you always want to be wary of research in, in a field that's done by someone that's not in that field. Yeah. Um, yep. <laughs> Keith Chen was an economist, not a, not a linguist. I, I don't want to, you know, sort of crap on his research too much, but, um, and there have been subsequent studies that have tried to control for yet more variables. Yeah. Um, but you want to be skeptical about that sort of thing. And I think, right. I think at the end of the day, my take home message would be, you really want to start, you want to start from the data and, and see what that tells you. You don't want to start from a conclusion yeah. and work backwards from that. You know, you don't want to start with, well, I, I think, you know, language probably influences thought. Let's, let's look for what confirms that hypothesis right. and ignore anything that doesn't. Exactly. You don't want to do that. Exactly. And, and that is kind of one of the problems with the Coco experiments is that, um, I, that's one of the criticisms yeah. is that she was really wanting to communicate. Yeah. There was a strong Coco. desire yeah. to, to have a particular outcome there. So, so now we're, we're trying to figure this out with, with more controls, which is really interesting. Yeah. Well, just for time, I want to, I want to end here, but then at, if, if you're willing to do a couple more questions after. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, just in ending, I want to, to let you know that his YouTube channel, which he writes for, is The Ling Space. So The Ling Space, so L-I-N-G. Mm -hmm. uh, and yeah, the, it, it's wonderful. He's got, you've got interviews with, um, different linguists. You've got oh yeah, we've just got, lessons on language. Yeah, yeah. We've got some uh, more uh, you know introductory stuff that I think anyone could get something out of. We have some more advanced stuff that you tend to only uh, sort of yeah. get exposed to at the graduate level, and then we have more general interest videos and I think lots of interviews which people would find interesting yeah. as well. You've had Steven Pinker on. You've yeah. had who else have you had? On? Uh, we've had Dan Dennett on. Uh, yeah. We've had uh, the evolutionary biologist to come so Fitch talk about the evolution of language. Uh, we've had Lisa Pearl talk about um, various uh, specific problems with um, how how we let's say associate the position of a word into in, in a sentence to a particular meaning for that word. Mm -hmm. uh, it's called the linking problem. She talks a little bit about that, and we've had we people talking about soci sociolinguistics as well. I mean, we tend to use our interviews to really supplement our own. Uh, maybe a, a lack of knowledge in a particular field and, and, and get them to help us out a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Uh, all right. Now, now let's, let's kind of like do some rapid fire, like less, well, less than a minute on some questions. Oh, okay. something else. Well, I, I, I don't want to disappoint people because I know we raised the Russian sentence. Up oh, yes. The beginning, so maybe yes. we should give away the, 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 the punchline there. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Talk about the Russian sentence. So let's remind everyone what it was again. So the sentence yeah. was more people have been to Russia than I have. Uh, this is known as a grammatical illusion. Uh, it's an illusion in the sense that um, it, it's, it usually sounds pretty good to people. Um, and when you ask them to describe what it actually means, um, people either have a really hard time explaining what it means, or to the extent that they can give an explanation, those explanations just don't converge. Uh, you get one group of people saying that it means this for sure, and another group of people saying it means that for sure. It's kind of like the the dress that broke the internet a few years ago, right? Yeah, half of the yeah. people were saying it was white and gold. The other half were saying black and blue. Yeah. Hashtag team white and gold for me. Yeah. But I know it was actually <laughs> black and blue. Um, anyway, so this, this sentence kind of breaks people's brains a little bit. Um, and really, um, you know, it's an interesting case of an experiment being able to uncover, because it's been researched into these grammatical illusions and what seems to be going on. Uh, and the short version is that you know, what does seem to be going on in these sentences in terms of why they sound good, even though they don't really seem to mean all that much when you really dig into them. Because again, if you think about it, more people have been to Russia than I have. Well, then I have what? Like, yeah. okay, you're counting the number of people that have been to Russia and you're comparing that to the number of you that have been to Russia. Like, yeah. Yeah. it kind of works, but it's also kind of weird. Um, and it turns out that the biggest variable that seems to be influencing how good or bad these, these illusory sentences sound is the kind of verb that's actually put into the sentence. Mm -hmm. So it turns out that sentences which have a verb uh, like, let's say, jump, uh, or um, maybe you won't want to pick a transitive verb, like uh, phoned their parents. So uh, let's say more people have phoned their mm -hmm. parents than I have. That tends to sound pretty good. And the reason is that phoning your parents is something that you can do multiple times. It's yeah. not something that you only do once in your life. So 
it, it seems like what's being compared is the number of times that some group of people have done this activity, like phoning their parents, versus the number of times you've done that activity. Yeah. Uh, and these sentences get worse when you put in a verb that can't be repeated, like graduated high school, right? So mm -hmm. more pa more people have graduated high school than I have. I mean, <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, it, again, it kind of makes yeah. sense, but it, it's weirder. And in principle, it's weirder because you don't generally graduate high school more than once in your life. Right. Um, right. And so you can't really count that happening in the same way that you can count how many times you phone your parents. And so you find this, when you control for all other factors and you just kind of swap out the verbs in these sentences, you get better or worse sounding sentences. And what's interesting is this doesn't really match up with people's impressions of how these sentences work. There's there's a big a disconnect between what people subjectively feel is going on in these mm -hmm. sentences versus what experiment is fine, which is at the end of the day, I think a great argument for why you want to study these things scientifically, why you can't really rely on your own personal feelings or subjective yeah, intuitions, intuitions about something. Yeah. You kind of want to design an experiment, come up with a hypothesis, yeah. figure out what it predicts, and then see if that prediction comes true. Yeah. yeah. Great, great. So yeah, rapid fire questions. Yeah, rapid fire questions. Okay, we'll so we'll like try. a minute or less. I'll try not to talk too long on these. Why are certain words forbidden in, in a society? Uh, yeah, that, that tends to be associated with particular things. Um, you know, often it gets associated with bodily function. So if something yeah. is sort of um, kind of gross or, uh, or, or, you know, health related, um, mm. you can get words that are end up being taboo. Uh, words that are taboo, in, interestingly enough, here in Quebec tend to be very much tied to religion. Yeah. Um, right. So things like and, you know, warning here to our Quebec French speakers, but things like that mm. tend to be pretty bad. Uh, yeah. And and in that case, it's it's associated more with um, the taboo um, surrounding um, religion, which is kind of a unique phenomenon here yeah. in Quebec. We've become a very secular society. Mm -hmm. um, well, I noticed I noticed in America, I say, um, can I use your bathroom? You say, can I use your washroom? Yeah. In England, they say, can I use your toilet? Yeah. Yeah. And toilet is the most descriptive as it's the thing that you're going to, you know, use. <laughs> and so in America, we've we've kind of made that taboo and we say bathroom, even though there's bit. almost never, never a, bath. a bath. Yeah. If you had a restaurant, you still ask for the bathroom. Yeah. Um, and you use the washroom, yeah. which yeah, there you can usually wash yourself in there. But yeah. I, I think that's interesting. And then we also have so I think there's also an association with, oh, did this word come from a lower, uh, what what mainstream society thinks of as, as a lower class mm -hmm. subculture? Mm -hmm. Did the word come from there? If so, it's taboo to use. Yeah, yeah sure. Or a more versus less prestigious mm -hmm. language, you know, one one kind of language, you know, let's say if, if a word has been borrowed from Latin or Greek, it's probably viewed with high prestige. Right. Um, you know, versus a, a language, uh, versus a word which maybe has been borrowed from a language which isn't as sort yeah. of socially prestigious, let's say. And then, of course, we have thing like things that were associated with harassment in the past. Sure. Now yeah. you can't say yeah. them. So yeah. the N word is the obvious one in English. Where yeah, I mean, uh, usually, was... usually social uh, labels end up um, acquiring a taboo over time yeah. and have to be replaced. There's actually this phenomenon known as the a euphemism conveyor belt oh yeah or the euphemism yeah. treadmill i should say yeah um because what usually ends up happening is uh you'll replace one with label with another because the label has acquired a negative connotation but because unfortunately you haven't eliminated discrimination and and right. the like from society the new label ends up acquiring the bad connotation and you have to replace it yet again right it, it, well so it used to be normal to if someone had a mental disability to say that they're mentally retarded right. yeah you cannot say that now yeah right and even mental disability um, is being replaced with, oh, this person is mentally diverse. Sure. Yeah, yeah. Neuro, and, neurodiverse versus neurotypical is, is one of the newer. And that's, terms. so this is a conveyor belt and it's going to keep changing until, it is keep changing. until there's no longer. There's nothing we can really do about yeah. it. Yeah. That, that's really interesting. So we went over a minute on that one. But then, okay, can you guys remind us oh, of your channel name? We already did that. Um, Jonathan, Jonathan Jerry. Oh yeah. Why are there seemingly fewer distinctive accents throughout English Canada versus England? Uh, yeah, right. Or is this indeed true? Um, I I 
I suspect it's true. I don't know for sure, right? I mean, there is sort of this this trope that um, you know you can tell uh, what block someone lives on in England depending right. on their accent. Like it's it's that discreet and that discriminating. Right. Um, whereas English, you, you know, you do find some differences. Um, you know, there's a dialect of Montreal English that I speak, which is different from how someone who grew up in Calgary speaks. But it's not dramatic. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, the most dramatic differences you find are, are uh, let's say, um, s standard Canadian English to the extent that there is such a thing versus Newfoundland English, which tends right. to be pretty pronounced as, as a different dialect. Um, I'm not sure if I can answer the why question. It's not something I've given enough thought to. Um, I think I, can, I think I might be able to answer that or just give a hi my own hypothesis sure. is that Canada is much younger than England is. That's true. And we've had radio and other forms of communication well, that's a good point. That's a good that, point. Yeah. That, that make things universal. Like right now, the, the English that has no accent is the English spoken in Hollywood. I mean. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, again, has no accent here is it, sort we of think a, has a, no a relative. Accent, right? Yeah, it's more how, how it, about how it's perceived. Um, but that's, a, that's an interesting point. You know, as I mentioned earlier, it could turn out to be the case that English changes more slowly now, that there is this kind of external standard by which English is English and that we can compare ourselves to. Mm -hmm. uh, it'll be interesting to see what happens over the next thousand yeah. years. <laughs> uh, someone, um, Stacy Thompson just mentions, I learned a lot about nonverbal communication after getting a cat. Oh. I find this super interesting. <laughs> the amount of communication we can have with animals is quite spectacular. I mean, my dog understands if I'm angry at him, <laughs> not knowing at all what language I speak. I mean, I, my, my dogs here um, were raised with French, so they do understand a lot of French words. But when I come here and I'm yelling at them in English, they know exactly what they I'm know. saying. Yeah. They, they have no problem with it. And they're very good at reading language. And I suppose that we were good at reading language before our, our species, if you were to follow us back in time, before we had developed language, we could tell if someone was upset and sure. why they were upset just yeah. by looking at them. And maybe maybe um, it would just be worth adding on here that, um, you know, in a way your dog does understand what you're saying and in a way they don't, right? So you could yell a very positive message or a very negative one and they'll take the same message from that. Yeah. You know, they won't understand the propositional content of the message. Um, you know, you could scream, I love you, or you could scream, I hate you. In either case, your dog's probably gonna think you're pretty pissed off. Um, whereas, of course, as humans, we do understand that those sentences mean completely different things. I mean, that's that's language, right? It's it's that association of of discrete combinations of sounds with with complex ideas. Mm -hmm. um, let's see. Why do people not all understand phenome based languages? Oh, phoneme based or languages. Phone sure. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, Phoneme based language. Well, I'm I'm not I'm not totally sure here what's meant by phoneme based language. So a, a phoneme, all languages have phonemes. So phonemes are just the distinctive uh, sounds that a language uses to distinguish one word from another. So, mm -hmm. you know, we talked about this at the beginning of the conversation. A P and B are phonemes in English because if you replace a peep sound with a B sound, you get a different word. So a, a pat is different from a bat. Uh, whereas other languages don't make this distinction. So a P yeah. sound and a B sound aren't phonemes. The sounds still exist, but they aren't separated in the same way that they are in, a, in the head of an English speaker. Yeah. Um, I, yeah, I'm trying to understand what the question means here. I mean, certainly um, different writing systems for different languages can more more or less transparently reflect the sounds of that language. Mm -hmm. I mean, English is kind of notorious for how Poorly, our writing system reflects the way that the language is actually spoken. We, we have a very irregular spelling system that no. has all kinds of silent G's and H's. Yeah. And well, can someone be born with a disability that makes them um, blind to sound differences? So oh. I've, I've heard of like face blindness yeah, where people right. can't recognize someone by their mm -hmm. face. I would imagine we have similar disabilities with well, English. That's a really interesting question. Um, I I would love to find out if that's true. <laughs> I I have no idea, but. It wouldn't totally surprise me if that were the case. And that, that kind of level of discrimination seems to be so uniquely human. And if it's associated with, let's say, a particular brain region that were to take um, damage, maybe they would lose that ability or never acquire it. Yeah. Um, do you think that language gave us 
an advantage over Neanderthals. Um, you might not be as super up to date on the current research on Neanderthals, but right, yeah. we do not know how much language they had. It was assumed in the past that they didn't have much language, but we actually, those conclusions have been very poorly mm. um, founded. Yeah, all, all I can really say here is that it's a tough question to answer how old language is. I mean, the time span is enormous. It, it can be as recent as uh, maybe, um, you know, 100,000 years ago that mm -hmm. we've had language uh, to a million or two. I mean, it probably it hasn't existed in, in one form. I mean, we're not supposing here that it popped up fully formed. That's not generally how a, a cognitive or a biological feature arises, as right. you know, much better than, right. much better than I do. Um, so it can be tricky. I mean, that's one of the trickiest things to study because language doesn't leave a fossil. It's not really something you can dig up and look at. Uh, writing is not the same as language, so we can't really look at writing as, as a, 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 it's a relatively recent invention. Writing right. in one form or another has only been around for about six, five, 6,000 years. Um, and even then it took a few thousand to get to the, it's only been independently invented a, a handful of times. And it, it usually has to go through a lot of stages to get to where yeah. writing exists today, which is an alphabetic system where individual graphemes represent individual phonemes and can sort of reliably replicate the language in a, in a way that actually accurately transmits information. Yeah. It's a tough question. Yeah, so just as far as why did we do better than the Neanderthals, uh, I, I've i looked at a lot of different hypotheses about this and I don't think that any of them are solid enough to like mm -hmm. really say this is why we succeeded and they did not. Yeah. I mean, first of all, we interbred with right. them. So we're all a little bit Neanderthal. They, yeah, uh, not all of us actually. Oh, oh really? All uh, Europeans only. Oh, interesting. Um, interesting. Most Africans that haven't mixed with Europeans right. yet at all don't have the ah. called DNA. Oh, that's in them. cool. Yeah. yeah. So we have, uh, yeah, it, it's mysterious. Maybe they died off because of disease. Mm. Maybe they did, died off because they had less taboos than we did. So okay. interbreeding with us was fine for them, but it was weird for us. So it, um, yeah, I, who knows? It's, it's, it's a mystery. Hmm. But, um, let's see. I think we should probably wrap this up because it's 1121 here. Um, <laughs> uh, Mac Taylor asks, did he explain that the, the I, he wasn't here for the start. He's asking if we already explained your t-shirt. Oh, right. Yes, we yeah, did. We did. Yeah. Um, so you can watch that later when you're rewatching this. And yeah, I'm, I'm a new uncle today. I just learned from my brother in the comments. Oh, congratulations. <laughs> so uh, that's pretty awesome. <laughs> Thanks for pointing that out, Mike. But you know, more people have become uncles than you have. Yeah, more people have become <laughs> uncles than I have. So, <laughs> um, And then I just want to leave you with um, a final sentence that a friend of mine invented. It always takes longer than it does. And this is really a really nice. funny sentence to think about. And Unfortunately, we didn't have a chance to talk about this, but you actually spent a long, a long time thinking about that and analyzing that sentence. Yeah. It always takes longer than it does. Why is that sentence weird and funny? And why does that make you think? So <laughs> with that, stay curious, everyone. It was wonderful. Thank you for, for coming oh, on the show. You. I had a good time. Again, the YouTube channel is The Ling Space, yes. and you can learn the basics of linguistics there. You can learn, you can see really cool interviews, Steven Pinker and Dan Dennett and so on. For sure. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Yeah, my pleasure. And stop broadcast.